I too wish to speak to all those who would like to know about eternal families and about families being forever. One year ago, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints issued a proclamation to the world concerning the family. It summarizes eternal gospel principles that have been taught since the beginning of recorded history, even before the earth was created. The doctrine of the family begins with heavenly parents. Our highest aspiration is to be like them. The Apostle Paul taught that God is the father of our spirits. From the proclamation, we read, in the premortal realm, spirits, sons, and daughters knew and worshiped God and their eternal Father and accepted His plan by which His children could obtain a physical body and gain eternal earthly experience to progress toward perfection and ultimately realize His or her divine destiny as heir of eternal life. The proclamation also reiterates to the world that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and the family is central to the Creator's plan of the eternal destiny of His children. From the earliest beginnings, God established the family and made it eternal. Adam and Eve were sealed in marriage for time and all eternity, and thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance and gospel preached and a decree sent forth that it should be in the world until the end thereof, and thus it was. And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and replenish the earth. The Savior himself spoke of this sacred marriage covenant and promise when he gave the authority to his disciples to bind in heaven sacred covenants made on earth. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In this latter day, the promise of eternal families was restored in 1829 when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood were restored to the earth. Seven years later, in the Kirkland Temple, the keys to perform the sealing ordinances were restored as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. Elijah the prophet, who, had ta who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi. The keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. With the restoration of these keys and priesthood authority comes the opportunity for all who are worthy to receive the blessings of eternal families. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out and the endowment which my servants have endowed in this house. What is the promise of these sealings which are performed in the temple? The Lord outlines the promise and requirements in these sacred verses. And again, verily, I say unto you, if a man marry a woman by my word, which is my law, and by the new and everlasting covenant, and it, is un and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of this priesthood. And it shall be said of them, He shall come forth in the first resurrection, and if it be after the first resurrection, in the next resurrection, and shall inherit the thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, and all heights and depths. Then shall it be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and shall be of full force when they are out of this world, and they shall pass by the angels and gods which are set there, to their exaltation and glory in all things, as hath been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds for ever and ever. As taught in this scripture, an eternal bond doesn't just happen as a result of sealing covenants we make in the temple. How we conduct ourselves in this life will determine who we will be and what we will be in all the eternities to come. To receive the blessings of the sealing that our Heavenly Father has given to us, we have to keep commandments and conduct ourselves in such a way 
that our families will want to live with us in the eternities. The family relationships we have here on this earth are important, but they are much more important for their effect on our families for generations in mortality and throughout all eternity. By divine commandment, spouses are required to love each other above all others. The Lord clearly declares, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shall cleave unto her and none else. The proclamation states, By divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness, and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. By divine design, mothers are primarily responsible for the nurturing of their children. By divine design, husband and wife are equal partners in their marriage and parental responsibilities. By direct commandment of God, parents have a sacred duty to teach their children to love and serve one another, to observe the commandments of God, and to be law-abiding citizens in the countries where they reside. Because of the importance of the family to the eternal plan of happiness, Satan makes a major effort to destroy the sanctity of the family, demean the importance of the role of men and women, encourage moral uncleanliness and violations of sacred law of chastity, and to discourage parents from placing the bearing and rearing of children as one of their highest priorities. So fundamental is the family unit to the plan of salvation that God has declared a warning that those individuals who violate the covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God, their Maker. The disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. While our individual salvation is based on our individual obedience, it is equally important that we understand that we are each an important and integral part of a family, and the highest blessings can be received only within an eternal family. When families are functioning as designed by God, the relationships found therein are the most valued of mortality. The plan of the Father is that the family love and companionship will continue into the eternities. Being one in a family carries a great responsibility of caring, loving, lifting, and strengthening each member of the family so that all can righteously endure to the end and in mortality and dwell together throughout eternity. It is not enough just to save ourselves. It is equally important that parents, brothers, and sisters are saved in our families. If we return home alone to our Heavenly Father, we will be asked, where is the rest of the family? This is why we teach that families are forever. The eternal nature of an individual becomes the eternal nature of the family. The eternal nature of our body and our spirit is a question often pondered by those who live in mortality. All people who will ever live on earth are members of a human family and are eternal children of God, our loving Heavenly Father. After birth and tasting of death and mortality, all will be resurrected because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God the Father. Depending on our individual obedience to the laws, ordinances, and commandments of God, each mortal can have the blessing of attaining eternal life, that is, returning to live in the presence of their Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for all the eternities to come. Through making and keeping the sacred covenants found in the temple ordinances, individuals can return to the presence of God and be reunited with their families eternally. The home is where we are nurtured and where we prepare ourselves for living in mortality. It is also where we prepare ourselves for death and for immortality because of our belief and understanding that there is life after death, not only for the individual but also for the family. Some of the greatest lessons of gospel principles about the eternal nature of the family are learned as we observe how members of the Church, when faced with adversity, apply gospel principles in their lives and in their homes. In the past year, I have witnessed the blessings of joy which come to those who honor and revere the gospel teaching 
of the Eternal Family during times of adversity in their lives. A few months ago, I had the opportunity of visiting a man who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. As a devoted priesthood holder, he was confronted with the realities of mortality. He found strength, however, in the example of the Savior, who in the Lord's Prayer, after this manner, therefore pray ye, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. My friend took courage in knowing that as Jesus was required to endure great pain and agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, while completing the atoning sacrifice, he uttered the words, O Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. My friend came to accept the phrase, thy will be done, as he faced his own poignant trials and tribulations. As a faithful member of the Church, he was now confronted with some sobering concerns. Particularly touching were his questions. Have I done all that I need to do to faithfully endure to the end? What will death be like? Will my family be prepared to stand in faith and be self-reliant when I am gone? We had the opportunity to discuss all three questions. They are clearly answered in the doctrine and taught to us by our Savior. We discussed how he had spent his life striving to be faithful, to do what God asked of him, to be honest in his dealings with his fellow men, and to with all others, to care for and love his family. Isn't that as meant what is meant by enduring to the end? We talked about what happens immediately after death, about what God has taught us about the world of spirits. It is a place of paradise and happiness for those who have lived righteous lives. It is not something to fear. After our conversation, he called together his wife and extended family, children and grandchildren, to teach them the doctrine of the Atonement, that all would be resurrected. Everyone came to understand that, just as the Lord has said, while there will be mourning at the temporary separation, there is no sorrow for those who die in the Lord. His blessing promised him comfort and reassurance that all would be well, that he would not have pain, that he would have additional time to prepare his family for his departure, even that he would know the time of his departure. The family related to me that on the night before he passed away, he said he would go on the morrow. He passed away the next afternoon at peace with all his family at his side. This is the solace and comfort that comes to us when we understand the gospel plan and know that families are forever. Contrast these events with an incident which happened to me when I was a young man in my early twenties. While serving in the Air Force, one of the pilots in my squadron crashed on a training mission and was killed. I was assigned to accompany my fallen comrade on his final journey home to be buried in Brooklyn. I had the honor of standing by his family during the viewing and funeral services and representing our government and presenting the flag to his grieving widow at the graveside. The funeral service was dark and dismal. No mention was made of his goodness or his accomplishments. His name was never mentioned. At the conclusion of the services, his widow turned to me and asked, Bob, what is really going to happen to Don? I was then able to give her the sweet doctrine of the resurrection and the reality that if baptized and sealed in the temple for time and all eternity, they could be together eternally. The clergyman standing next to her said, that is the most beautiful doctrine I have ever heard. The fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ brings great comfort in stressful times of mortality. It brings light where there is darkness and a calming influence where there is turmoil. It gives eternal hope where there is mortal despair. It is more than just beautiful doctrine. It's a reality in our lives that if we can be obedient and obtain the eternal rewards that God grants us, if we will draw nigh unto Him and embrace the eternal doctrine, we will be blessed. Another incident that has touched my life recently happened when a young man with a terminal illness passed away. He knew that his illness 
would first take away his manual dexterity and his ability to walk, then his progression would take his ability to speak, and finally his respiratory system would cease to function. But he also had faith that families are forever. With this knowledge, he spoke to each of his children and recorded video recordings for when he was gone. He produced recordings to be given to his sons and daughters at important sacred occasions in their lives, such as baptisms, priesthood ordinations, and weddings. He spoke to them with tender love of a father who knew that while his family was forever, for a time he would not physically be able to be with them, but spiritually he would never leave their side. The knowledge and understanding of the doctrine that God lives and Jesus is the Christ and that we have an opportunity to be resurrected and live in the presence of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, makes it possible to endure otherwise tragic events. The doctrine brings a brightness of hope again into another otherwise dark and dreary world. It answers the simple questions of where we came from, why we are here, and where we are going. These are the truths that must be taught and practiced in our homes. I want to express appreciation to every widow with her faith that gives us faith and their children when they lose their husband and father, for every widower who loses a wife, and for the children who remain faithful and teach us by their faith this doctrine. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. Through His resurrection, we will all have the opportunity of being resurrected. This is not just an individual blessing. It is much more than that. It is a blessing to each one of us and to our families that we may be eternally grateful that we can live in the presence of God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, that we may be together in the eternities to come, that we might understand the joy. And it is not only that we teach the doctrine, but we live true to it in our lives and in our families. It's my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.